Greetings. I would like to call to order today, January the 9th, 2024, the public hearing for the City of Tampa Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome everyone. I am your chair, Dominique Cobb of the commission, and I would like to introduce the other chair members. Hi, I'm Tom Plucon. Uh, Carrie Ann Kanch. Um, Mary Shukraft. Thank you all. Uh, if you are here to present a request, please be thorough and concise. At the mic, identify yourself and your relationship to the project. Uh, before beginning the presentation, the commissioners will not ask any questions during the presentation. Okay. Next, the uh, presentation of the staff report. Then we're going to, um, Madam Chair, uh, Marnie Pesnock from the City Attorney's Office. Can we have the reading of the minutes? Ah, yes, my apologies. Commissioners? I move to accept the meeting minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. We are accepting of the um, one moment. Good morning, uh, Commissioners. Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. Uh, just with uh, initial announcement. Uh, we do have uh, some time constraints today that are going to um, limit our uh, meeting till 10 a.m. So we want to get into the business right away. So uh, to begin with, uh, I'll ask our legal counsel to um, inquire about conflicts of interest and ex parte communication. Good morning again. Kamaria pettis Mackle from the City Attorney's Office. Are there any commissioners who have any conflicts of interest regarding the item that's any item that's on the agenda? No. Additionally, um, can you please disclose whether or not you've had any ex parte communications regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? Thank you. And to begin, we will uh, administer the swearing. So anyone in the audience who's going to be providing any type of presentation or public testimony, if you could please stand and raise your right hand for Ms. Guzman to administer the swearing. I do. Thank you. And with that, we are ready for our uh, first item of consideration uh, under the agenda item number seven. I do want to um, say that this is a uh, uh, landmark designation for the John F. Germany Library. We're very happy to bring this to you as our first uh, official business uh, in this calendar year. And I have uh, asked uh, Heather Bonds with our staff to lead the uh, presentation. And I know we have some members of the public here to uh, participate in the discussion as well. Um, so with that, uh, if it's the board's pleasure, Heather can begin the presentation. Yes, thank you. John F. Germany Public Library Landmark nomination today. We're unable to see it right now.
you're running the PC, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you know. That's Tamley there. I don't have any. There it is. Okay. Just see if we can get in. There we go. Now we're ready. Thank you. Working <laughs> perfect. The city's landmark designation protects the properties that have been determined to be of distinctive character, architectural value, and cultural significance to the city. Each structure represents a piece of physical development of Tampa's history, from the Grand Tampa Bay Hotel to the modest shotgun structures that were built by the hundreds to support the early cigar industry. Each building was constructed to satisfy Tampa's booming growth as the city transformed itself from a farming community to a major urban city center. Evaluation criteria is based on the National Park Service criteria to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Each site considered must meet at least one of these four criteria. In addition, they must have a quality of significance in American state or local history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, or cultural or culture, and possess an integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. We have used this criteria to consider this landmark nomination. The library is located between West Tyler Street and West Cash Street for facing North Ashley Drive. The auditorium is directly behind the rear of the library. The Strass Theater is behind it to the north and the parking garage and children's museum is to the south. The Hillsborough River is directly to the west. This picture shows the historic block of the existing library Looking east in 1921, the residential dwellings that made up the block are shown on the 1915 Sanborn map, which indicates the block was made of wood frame, one-story structures with open front porches. The Southern Lumber and Supply Company and Planning Mill and mill work with over 500,000 lumber in stock is noted on the full Sanborn page. A large lumber shed down in the corner um, can be seen as well as a metal shed. From the picture and the Sanborn map, it is determined that this block was completely residential, sandwiched between the lumber yard in the Hillsborough River to the west and the emerging city to the east. The eastern block after Tampa Avenue had brick buildings, including the Leroy Hotel, Bank of Commerce, White Star Laundry, moving pictures, bakeries, and other commercial uses. According to the 1950 Polk City Directory, the homes along Ashley were occupied by black residents. 902 Ashley by Mary James, a widowed cook, 904 Ashley by Samuel Edwards, a porter, and 908 Ashley by Maria C. Murray, a cook. I'll now describe the historical backgrounds and the value of the library. Tampa's first library came by way of the Carnegie Foundation who bestowed a grant to the city of Tampa to build a library in 1912. Designed by architect Fred James, the library near Franklin and 7th Avenue opened on April 27, 1917. The masonry and brick structure sat on the geographical center of the city at the time. For over 50 years, it served as Tampa's central library until the need for a new <coughs> library hub was evident. Helen V. Steele served as the first director of the Tampa Public Library System for the opening of the library in 1917 to 1947. As the city grew, individual library branches opened to serve different parts of the city. In 1919, a segregated library for Tampa's black population opened at the Harlem Academy, which moved to the Urban League headquarters in 1923. The Seminole Heights Branch Library opened in 1927 in the neighborhood park, and in 1934, Ybor, Ybor City opened a branch. Throughout the 30s to the 60s, local women's clubs also opened library central centers in Tipple Terrace, Brandon, Port Tampa, and Plant City. Ms. Steele led the development of a connected citywide library system. However, as the city continued to grow, the need for a new library center became apparent. Tampa aspired to have a library hub which would serve the needs of all of its citizens and offer programs that truly benefited the community and could progress with people's lives. Written by the next director of the library systems, William S. Fries, 
He addressed what the new library should be, physically and internally. Addressing the physical attributes, Mr. Fries requested that the public library be inviting. It should be efficient, flexible, and could be expanded upon. That there should be the highest standards of lighting. It should share common physical characteristics with other public buildings. He stated a desire for the furniture and equipment to harmonize with the architecture and contribute to the library's programs. That it should be located and designed and provide maximum accessibility and space for a full range of services and functions. Most importantly, that those functions determine what the building should be. He stated that the primary function of a library is to help people get along in the world, to help school children get better grades, to help businessmen make better, more money, to help preachers write better sermons, to help newspaper men. It is the function of an open door. The public library is a way to escape from the narrow area of our lives into the field, finite, no doubt, but unbounded of the wisdom and the experience of all mankind. Thus the concept of building and designing from the intended use of the inside to reflect on the exterior. This is one of the main concepts of mid-century modern architecture, one that this building envelops. But first a location was needed. As the area continued to evolve away from industrial uses, the downtown area became more defined as an office and commerce area. The city looked to highlight the Hillsborough River as a unique asset within the city. A riverfront urban renewal project was initiated to rejuvenate and modernize development along the Hillsborough River. The library location was selected to connect the northern end of the planned riverfront complex to surrounding shopping, transportation links, and abundant parking. The city also set aside land for a cultural center. The first private riverfront urban renewal project was sold to Central Life Insurance Company of Florida, Black Life Insurance Company. IBM also proposed an eight-story structure within the project. Today, the Riverwalk is a celebrated feature of Tampa's amenities as originally envisioned over 60 years ago. As the first structure planned as part of the Riverfront Urban Renewal Project of the 1960s, the library is a physical reminder of how Tampa has placed an importance of incorporating local culture and history in future land planning. Raising money to build the library was another concern. In 1960, local judge John Germany was elected as president of Friends of the Library, a group charged to plan the development and funding of the new library. The committee was comprised of other civic leaders in Tampa and supported by Mayor Nick Nuccio and the, city, and the Tampa City Council. Mr. Germany spearheaded the funding source by proposing a cigarette tax bond issue. The total construction cost was $3.2 million, including grant and taxed money. Here are some pictures from the opening day and the <coughs> announcement. More pictures of the opening day. This is a brochure from 1968 that shows the original floor plans um, and where the different various uh, departments were located. Tampa had also received a grant to upgrade library training, add specialized sections, and increase pay scales. These specialized areas were integrated as part of the newly designed building and included business, science, technology, and fine arts. The new library allowed for new and advanced positions, such as department heads for each of those subject components. The first library director, Cecil Beach, stated that these specializations would provide a better librarian service to customers' interest in specific subjects. This approach was a departure from the classic general organization of the existing library system. Shown here, the local history and genealogy department was originally on the second floor. Now it's on the fourth floor. The second floor also included young adult children's departments. The first floor included information desks and business, science, and technology departments. And the third floor had the book stacks. The original fourth floor had the admin offices. The new Tampa Public Library was the first fully integrated library serving all of Tampa citizens, regardless of race. It served as an important cultural center for Tampa, offering resources and programs targeted to all races, genders, and ages. For example, to encourage teens to visit the library, the Youth Services Department sponsored Friday night rock concerts. The summer of 1969 series featured local bands and DJs. They were held in the Bookmobile Tunnel, attracting over 1,500 local teens per concert. 
We'll now review the importance of the architects and their design theories and inspirations. Two firms were selected to design the library, McLean, Rannan, McIntosh, and Bernito, and McElvey and Genuine. Referred to today as mid-century modern, the design of the building features stylistic details considered modern and in vogue for the 1960s. It also invokes the sentiment and emotional aspects of 1960 design theories. Frank McLean Jr. described his designs as warm and masculine in character and intended to avoid the scornful sterility and coldness of what is considered merely fine modern design. George McElvey and Jim Genuine merged their individual practices in 1961 to form McElvey and Genuine. Based in Tampa, they modeled their, form, their firm with a team approach to develop a site. Their firm strived not only to create buildings that would benefit the community, but also be beneficial to members of the community. Their promotional portfolio stated that the wider community must benefit from everything that we do. McElvey, Genuine, Stephanie, and Howard designed many structures in Tampa and throughout Florida in the modern style, similar to the styling they employed on the Tampa Public Library. These images are from an undated project portfolio, which exhibits the consistent use of modern styling with overhangs, cancer levered projections, and heavy concrete panels. Similar to the library, the styling typifies the mid-century architecture movement and physical appearance and the raw utilitarian feel of each structure. Onto the significance of the design itself. The John Germany Library is a pristine example of mid-century modern styling in Tampa with notable architectural details, including the large concrete pillars, wide arcade, vertical travertine panels, glass multi-story windows, and a wraparound honeycomb exterior feature on top. The broad horizontal form is a typical mid-century design component. The domed auditorium also expresses details indicative of the mid-century modern movement with a round solid exterior with an overhanging terrace that seemingly floats over the landscaping below. The honeycomb hive, Brie Soleil, which tops the library, provides an architectural interest while providing a protective sun and heat barrier to the archive collection on the fourth floor. This delicate form breaks up the strong visual impact of the concrete panels below. There are several, there are several styling subtypes of mid-century design. Described as brutalistic, this styling concept lacked traditional architectural ornamentation where the structure framing is covered with an exterior framing, such as wood panels or brick, then adorned with stylistic details. Brutalistic architecture lacks the decoration in favor of visually obvious materials, such as concrete walls, which show molding patterns or even imperfections. Brutalistic architecture developed first in Europe in the 1950s as part of reconstruction efforts after World War II. Through the 1960s, brutalism became a movement to reject the nostalgia of past highly decorative architectural styles to build honest, organic buildings. Concrete is the most common material used in brutalistic architecture. Architects that favor concrete express that it allows for endless creativity that can be poured into molds to create unique shapes and forms. As one of the strongest building materials, it can hold up against extreme weather which is ideal for structures preserving archival materials. Using poured concrete molds also creates symmetric sections, pillars and panels for a unifying <coughs> look and unlike traditional handcrafted features, creating molded features can expedite construction time. The above image from the Tampa Tribune, January 5, 1968, shows the concrete form of the building. Originally, a cast stone was applied to the columns and panels. However, it was determined inappropriate and new panels and column covers were applied. The image also shows the library without the fourth floor honeycomb. Typical of mid-century fenestration, windows expanse the height of the building in an overall vertical orientation. Mid-century designs often incorporated or mesh the interior landscape up to the interior including the use of natural light with such large windows. The original cast stone applied to the exterior was removed and replaced prior to the library's opening in April 1968. The cast stone was replaced with Roman travertine used for over 2,500 years in Italy for governmental buildings and public buildings. 
utilized not only for its durability and strength, but for the beauty of the unique marble veins that run through it. It has a cream beige color with brown and reddish veins that run vertically with the panels. The insistent use of it on the library, which delayed the opening to ensure the correct exterior panels were used, shows how important this building was to the community, and that leadership wanted to ensure that the use of travertine and concrete, two of the most durable, stable, and long-lasting building materials, was for the ultimate longevity of the building. Mid-century modern architecture typically included landscaping and hardscaping elements, occasionally leading into or within the buildings in the form of planters and water features. The new library included fountains with colored lights flanking the entry. Today, the area surrounding the fountains is lush with palms, greenery, and other Florida native flora. Other hardscape includes a brick walk leading to the front entrance, which was updated from a concrete ramp and a low concrete wall. The hive or honeycomb crown of the structure provides texture and interest to the large panels and window expanses. The hexagon adds a geometric element common to mid-century architecture. This hexagon grid provides protection from the heat and glare of the sun to the archival materials located on the top floor. It also visually marries the auditorium and the library buildings to this common element. It is used to allow natural light into the otherwise darkened windowless auditorium between the layers of the domed roof. On the main library, it wraps around the entire top floor, inset from the roof of the three-story colonnade. A small walkable space between the honeycomb layer and the exterior of the wide glass windows creates a brise soleil, which were popular in the 1960s and 70s architecture. Gus Paris and Angel Oliva Jr. Associate Architects at McElvey and Genuine co-designed the auditorium. Mr. Oliva stated in his, that his inspiration for the unique multi-dome shapes was the Tropicana nightclub in Havana, Cuba. With a small but visually significant area to work with, he wanted the auditorium to have an independent but complementary design to the library. The rounded shape aimed to offset the broad, sharp angles of the main library. The honeycomb feature was utilized to connect the two structures while allowing natural light into the otherwise dark auditorium. The base of the auditorium was designed by Gus Paris, who utilized a design inspired by America's most notable modern architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. Desp described as Wrightian, the base has two geometric pyramidal layers and made of cement to stone. The Tropicana Nightclub in Havana, Cuba served as inspiration for the auditorium's multi-oval design. It was designed by Max Borges Jr. and constructed in 1951. Borges was also known for his modernistic designs in the 1950s and 60s in Havana. Borges worked with Felix Candela, a structural engineer from Mexico who specialized in lightweight concrete parabolic designs used for the Tropicana Club and Club Nautico in Cuba. Max Borges is likely the most well-known architect of Cuban modernistic architecture. The overall Cuban modernistic movement is defined by the concrete shells he utilized, as well as curving ramps, brise soleils, and airy interiors that often flow to the exterior, which is seen within the library and auditorium's designs. Felix Candela's creative use of concrete also pushed the modern movement forward using forms that had never been seen before in architecture. He designed the Bacardi Bottle Factory in Mexico using arches connecting to fenestration. Angel Oliva Jr. stated admiration and design inspiration from both Candela and Borges designs, which is evident in the simplified example of the auditorium. Our overall evaluation found that the library meets the City of Tampa's criteria for landmark status in the areas of A, B, and C. It meets criteria A, for over 100 years, the city of Tampa has prioritized and included a central library in community planning. The 1917 original library was located in the most central location of the city boundaries. This, as the first structure planned as part of the Riverfront Urban Renewal Project in the 1960s, is a physical reminder of how Tampa has placed an importance of incorporating its local cultural and history in future land planning. It meets criteria B. The building is associated with John F. Germany, who is significant to Tampa's history as a civic leader, local judge, and attorney, and as a dedicated champion to raise money for the library. It meets criteria C. 
The John F. Germany Library has a high integrity of design and has distinctive characteristics of mid-century modern architecture. The architects designed this and other city structures to reflect the contemporary attitudes of 1960s mid-century movements with simplistic angular and broad lines and geometric accents. Only a modest number of mid-century modern designs remain in Tampa. Today, the board is requested to make a recommendation to city council for or against this designation. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your presentation. Um, at the time, are we going to take? You can ask if there's any board member questions, but we also have to have public comment. I, I do have a question. Go ahead. Okay. So I, um, well, I love this building because I go there all the time. I like libraries in general. <laughs> um, but in the report, you reference, uh, well, it's mid-century modern for sure, but that is closely related to brutalist. I, when I see it, I really think of it as an as international style. Because it reminds me of the work of Le Carbusier and Aero Saarinen more than Brutalist. Because the tall building down the street, the round one, that's more Brutalist. But this has the elegance of the international style. But that was my only comment. Other than that, I think the report is awesome. Thank you. Any other? Also, I, um, this uh, library has a lot of history for my family as well. Not only the land that it sits on that is uh, originally African Americans, but also um, the type of cultural uh, events that happened there. And also through the 2000s when the uh, library was kind of losing a bit of the uh, interest, there was a start of a club where we would meet there. And one of the things that my children loved was the little train uh, on the children's side. So I hope that um, those things are, you know, stay. Um, and also the tunnel. So um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And also the history of the land is so important. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, and the friends of the library are there, um, especially Temple Terrace. I love the connection that you have. So thank you for the work that you're doing. All right, will there be any comments from the uh, audience or any swear-ins? Please come forward, state your name. You have three minutes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Amy Espinosa. Uh, do I need to state my address? No. Okay. Um, I'm here today to speak on behalf of this group of buildings um, I've loved for more than half of my life. Um, the first time I set foot in the John F. Germany, um, called the Central Library back then, I remember being immediately drawn to the space, um, the architecture, the art, the diversity of people, um, and the fact that it was a ghetto, it was a gateway to endless knowledge. It really made a lasting impression on me at the age of 15. Uh, fast forward to 2014, now a mother of two. My trips to the John F. Germany Library consisted of exposing my children to STEAM programs that were freely available. And those programs allowed them to explore coding, 3D printing, robotics, and art projects like sewing and quilling. I loved it, and of course they did too. Um, when I learned in 2017 that the annex was uh, marked for demolition, I was outraged. Although I was not particularly moved by the architecture of that structure, I knew it would be a tragic loss for our community if the library and auditorium were to suffer the same fate. It was then that I decided I needed to do something. At the time, I was organizing an annual event, and at the close of our event in 2018, I, that in 2018, we would save the library. I had no idea what that meant at the time, no idea how I could do that, or if it was even possible. Soon after, I started my quest, at a minimum, to raise awareness of this wonderful space. So I brought 80 people in 2018 to the auditorium that never even knew it existed. Um, for this reason, I considered that event to be a, a success. Now people were aware. Shortly after 2019, I watched the dismantling of the annex, and I still felt uneasy about losing the library and auditorium. In September and December of 2023, 
I led around 50 people on a walk around the library and auditorium to bring awareness again to the art, the architecture, the archives, and the plethora of free resources that the library has to offer. Bringing awareness helps, but no building is truly safe until it's been designated as a local landmark. My budding relationship with architect Gus Paris, the co who co-designed the library's auditorium, I met his daughter, Elena, who's been my co-conspirator ever since. Last summer, Ellen and I, and I gained um, letters of support. The mayor signed in favor, and um, this beautiful report was written, and here we are today. The John F. Germany is a central part of the fabric that makes our city so great. It's welcomed everyone from day one, and it continues to be a place where all people can access knowledge and resources for free. The, it, that is significant to our city and growth as a society. The library and auditorium are the only structure in our city that connect us to the infamous works of great architects like Max Borges, Felix Candela, and Ed Durrell. I ask you today to preserve this library for free future generations. Please recommend the designation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Elena Paris Ketchum. I'm a lifelong resident of Tampa, having been born and raised here. My family is of Greek heritage, with my father's family immigrating to Tampa in the early 1900s. My mother is from Athens, Greece. My parents are in their mid-80s and still live here in Tampa. My father, Gus Paris, who you've heard of as one of the architects who worked for McKelvey Genuine at the time, um, was one of the two architects, the other being Angel Oliva, responsible for the design of the library's auditorium. One of my father's contributions is the base of the auditorium that, of course, was inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright. As a young girl, my parents would load my brother and me into the car, and we would drive around the city to not only see where my dad grazed his goats as a young boy at the corner of MacDill and Kennedy, where the Krispy Kreme donut shop is now, um, to see where his father and uncle had their businesses here in downtown Tampa, but to see the buildings of the city and his work, including the library and auditorium. It is a special feeling, even to this day, to drive past buildings that you know your family had a direct contribution and contact with the city. Not only my family, but the Oliva family and the Genuine families, as you know, are still here in Tampa as well. For the past couple of years, Amy and I had been talking about all the changes in Tampa and the need to preserve and protect older buildings and thereby the history of our community. From those initial conversations, we had a desire and passion to designate the library and the auditorium. Every great city has a great library, a public space for the community to gather and engage with each other. It seemed fitting for the John F. Germany Library and Auditorium to be designated since they fit squarely within the criteria under Chapter 27 of the City of Tampa Code. My father shared with me that the auditorium was an expression of modern architecture at the time, now known as mid-century modern period. There is no other building in downtown Tampa or the surrounding area like it. The library and auditorium directly speak to and provide the community with a direct and active link to the style of architecture. The city of Tampa designates historic properties that have distinctive character, architectural value, or cultural significance. I would submit that this property uh, covers all of those values and properties. By designating, we are safeguarding Tampa's heritage. The buildings are not only a reflection of our city's architectural history, but our social history as well, such as John F. Germany, the namesake of the library. The library and auditorium are for me a daily reminder that a handful of folks can spark the flame that will shine brightly for generations. I wholeheartedly support designation as the appropriate criteria under Chapter 727 have been met. Architecture is the physical manifestation of our community and its history. The John F. Germany Library and Auditorium speak to a certain time, Thank events, you. and significant purpose persons in our community's history and is worth protecting through designation. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Good morning. Um, my name is John Mullen, and I'm a local attorney, but today I'm here in my capacity 
as the president of the Friends of the John F. Germany Library, which is a chapter of the nonprofit Friends of the Library, Tampa, Hillsborough County, Inc. Now, the Friends are wholeheartedly support this effort to designate the JFG Library and its auditorium as local landmarks. The building has served our community well for nearly 60 years, and we are eager to see that continue for decades to come. Personally, I've regularly used the library since 1974, when my father began working as a librarian at that building and did so for 20 years. Since his passing, I've been a friend of the library for 25 years and have witnessed the changes, the interior renovations, and the improvements to the library in, and to all the services the library provides during that time. And I can attest that with the recent influx of residents in the several large apartment buildings and condominiums downtown uh, with an easy walking dif distance, the library is today a more vibrant and well-used space than it has been ever since its early years in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, for example, uh, today a few hundred University of Tampa students live just a block away in the 20-story Henry apartment building. Many of those students we see use the library as a convenient study hall and a resource center, just one block a walk, walk away for them. So we also see increased foot traffic from all the events that are held in the Curtis Hickson Park every weekend, almost every weekend it seems, we have foot traffic. And we as the Friends, we operate a bookstore and hold monthly book sales at the library where every dollar that we raise goes to pay for library programs and services. We sell more than $10,000 worth of books a year. And since most of our books are priced at $2 or less, I can tell you, that's a lot of books. <laughs> so uh, in addition to the library's architectural and cultural significance, uh, for all of the reasons that you heard through the presentation, the, the excellent presentation Ms. Bond uh, gave, um, I wanted to also point out that the library recognizes the contributions of one of our historically significant citizens, John F. Germany himself. Mr. Germany served our community as a circuit court judge and as the very first president of the Friends of the Library and as one of the founding partners of the prominent law firm of Holland and Knight, then a local law firm, now an international law firm. Well, coincidentally, I had the pleasure and the honor of working with Mr. Germany at Holland and Knight for more than a decade. And I can tell you, he was a very good man and he was humble. And I can also verify, Mr. Germany had absolutely nothing to do with the naming of that building in 1999 in his honor. That idea was developed and promoted by several local leaders who wanted to find a fitting way to honor Mr. Germany for his contributions to our community. And the City Council and Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners wholeheartedly wholly agreed. So in closing, um, for all the reasons that you've heard, uh, the Friends of the Library speak today in support of this effort, this landmarking effort. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more public comments? At this time, we are going to close the portion of public comments. Uh, commissioners, do you need any time to discuss? All right. Anyone? Can I make a motion? Yes. Okay. Um, I move to, uh, well, um, regarding the agenda HPC 2024-1, the John F. Germany Public Library, I move to recommend Tampa um, City Council approve the request to designate the John F. Germany Public Library located at 900 North Ashley Drive for local historic landmark designation because the application meets the criteria established in the City of Tampa, a code section 27-257 <coughs> for the following reasons. The bill, well, A, um, the building site structure and object uh, or district. Um, one, was constructed or achieved its significance during the period of historic significance as delineated in the National Registry of Historic Places guidelines or as established in the um, nomination <coughs> pursuant to those guidelines. And two, has a quality of significance in American state or local history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, culture, and culture, which, it, which is present in districts sites, buildings, structures, and objects that possess integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And one of section two um, that are associated with 
elements that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history, likewise known as, likewise known as criterion A of the National Registry criteria. Two, um, that is that are associated with the lives of persons significance in our past, otherwise known as criterion B of the National Registry criteria. And three, that embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or a method of construction, or that represents the work of a master, or the, that possesses high artistic values, or that represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual distinction, otherwise known as criterion C of the National Registry criteria. Um, Kamari pettis from the legal department. Um, if you could just add, also add um, in 27257 subsection C, mm -hmm. that is also um, consideration that the board must consider. Okay. So if you could just, if that is, if you're recommending this to be, uh, if you're recommending city council approve this for local landmark, you have to include that in your motion. Okay, so C? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, in addition to the criteria set forth um, in the subsections A and B above, the HPC and city council shall consider the following factors uh, for a landmark, landmark, landmark site or multiple property designation. Where is the owner's um, supports the designation. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed to move forward to City Council. Thank you for your time. I think that deserves a clap. <laughs> uh, commissioners, I just want to uh, take a moment to recognize the efforts of um, Ms. Ketchum and Espinosa, who have really is the reason that we're we're here today seeing seeing the value mobilizing um, the public to take interest and in working with uh, the genuine family who really has been very open in sharing the uh, successes and the resources of their family um, it's been uh, uh, kind of a trip down memory lane for me as well being a tampa native and experiencing a lot of the things that were voiced here today uh, with that library and, and truly recognizing that it is an iconic part of the downtown landscape. Uh, it joins, uh, it will join uh, with favorable uh, action by council, other libraries in the city that are historically designated, such as the Tampa Free Library, the West Tampa Library, and the Port, uh, Tampa, uh, Port City Tampa Library. So um, we do have some, we do have work with the county on a number of libraries and and continue to do so in, in their preservation and uh, evolving um, uh, use as, as times and, and needs change. Uh, also wanted to uh, recognize uh, my staff's excellent work on this particular uh, presentation and designation port report, uh, particularly Heather Bonds, who really uh, jumped into the project and took it to heart. Um, lastly, uh, to thank Mayor Castor for her support of this designation. This is a city-owned property, and it is an example of, of the administration's continued commitment to the preservation of city-owned historic resources. So with that, we will be moving this um, recommendation forward next to the uh, Hillsborough County Planning Commission for determination of consistency with the Tampa Comprehensive Plan, and then ultimately to two hearings in front of City Council for consideration at, in the final chapter of the landmark uh, designation. So thank you once again. Can you do a motion? Can uh, the board please do a motion, make a motion to receive and file all documents related to this application, please? I move to receive and file all documents related to this application. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank so you. In that we just have a few minutes before we lose our quorum, I would recommend that we um, uh, address uh, the design standards at the next public hearing. Um, it, it is something I think that uh, deserves uh, some discussion and will require more time. I can, however, I think quickly go through the landmark designations update and uh, can answer any questions that you might have on those. Oh, 
okay, do we need to make a motion for the design standards to be moved to next, or is that okay to move forward? Can you just make a motion for it to be on the next? I make a motion to move the Ybor City Design Standards update to the next hearing. Second. So moved. Um, I'm sorry, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Just get our PowerPoint queued up here. So similar to um, the uh, action that you just took, you've taken previous action on other properties and that's been something that the staff's been engaged in um, throughout uh, the uh, months since we met. So I wanted to update uh, the commission on uh, some of the progress that we've had with the other recommended properties. You have that on your screens, I assume, okay. Um, the first uh, property, It's not going to work. There we go. Uh, the first property to update you on is the Johnson Brothers houses. Uh, if you recall, the Johnson Brothers houses were constructed in 1900. Uh, they were uh, proposed for local designation in accordance with the re review criteria of 27257 uh, and found to be um, significant in the areas of uh, events uh, associated with community planning and development particularly in its association with the scrub and these being the last two remaining structures uh, that compose uh, residential structures that compose that area. Also uh, as associated with uh, persons of significance and ethnic history uh, with the black uh, community uh, that mainly uh, uh, occupied that area and lived there. And then also the distinct characteristics of architecture and its uh, simple um, residential frame vernacular style. <clears throat> uh, the application uh, was presented uh, last February uh, and uh, processed through our division, uh, was scheduled, subsequently scheduled for consideration at the HPC on May 16th where the favorable recommendation was made. Uh, subsequently, in June, the Planning Commission returned its determination of consistency, and then it was uh, uh, unanimously approved by City Council for an addition to the African American Heritage Sites grouping on October 19, 2023, under Ordinance Number 2023-138. And uh, since that uh, designation has occurred, the staff's been working with the Tampa Housing Authority and their architects on a redevelopment plan, which would restore these structures to uh, most likely a residential use, and then also include other uh, similarly designed structures along the face of Scott Street to, to somewhat pay homage to um, that street's original character. So we're excited to be involved in that uh, project, not only for the restoration of these two very important buildings, but also for the uh, reimagination of that streetscape and, and reuse uh, at a future time. So we will continue to update you along the way as, as this uh, develops. Uh, the Marjorie Park Marina Gatehouse uh, was also considered by the um, Commission for uh, Local Landmark Designation. It uh, was constructed in 1927 as part of the development of DP Davis on the Davis Islands uh, area uh, found to be uh, consistent with uh, criteria A2I associated with the events, particularly in recreation and community planning and development of that of Davis Islands. And under uh, A23 uh, 
which uh, embodies distinctive characteristics, particularly of its architecture in the Mediterranean Revival style. This is a, a, a photo of the structure now. It's uh, uh, occupied by um, the uh, Tampa Police Department's Marine Unit, who uses it, I think, in a very uh, uh, appropriate fashion. Um, and uh, the application was actually submitted through the, the Marine Unit uh, in June of last year. Uh, the HPC considered the recommendation on July 11th, and subsequently, um, this was a, a challenging uh, uh, legal description, so we had to actually uh, obtain a, a revised survey from a surveyor, so we had some extended time in there between the recommendation and the planning commission, but ultimately we resolved that uh, legal description and did receive favorable um, determination by the planning commission on consistency with the Tampa Compre Comprehensive Plan. Uh, we are uh, preparing for the city council first reading on January 25th, and uh, in accordance with that, the proper notice has been sent out, and we will be uh, presenting to the council uh, at that date. And then the last update is for Memorial Park Cemetery. Uh, there, as you recall, there was a great deal of community interest in this particular cemetery, which was established in 1919. Uh, associated with events under criteria uh, A1 for community planning and development, particularly in its association as a veteran cemetery and dealing with the military history of that. Uh, under uh, criteria uh, A2, associated with the persons significant in our past, which is the ethnic history of uh, the black Americans in the city of Tampa. And then also uh, A3, which embodies a distinctive characteristic. Um, in this case, uh, it's the funerary art associated with the cemetery itself. So this particular designation came to us uh, on June 14th of last year. It was a, also a city-initiated uh, designation, the city having uh, acquired the cemetery in recent years. The HPC did make its favorable, favorable recommendation in September of last year, and uh, we did engage with, uh, continue to engage with the public on uh, assuring that the designation report was um, uh, reflective of both the board's uh, motion and the, uh, the factual elements of the cemetery, which the community was very adamant in being reflected in the designation report, and uh, justifiably so. The Planning Commission did find this application consistent on December 21st, and it was subsequently scheduled for first reading at City Council, which is uh, February the 15th. Uh, we will be shortly conducting public notice for this. Uh, we'll be working with the community and our uh, contacts within the community, particularly the Friends of Belmont Height Memorial Park Cemetery, to ensure that the word's out to the community to come and support the designation on February the 15th. So that concludes uh, my update. Uh, I think uh, we've had a great deal of success in 2023 with some of these designations as well as others, and look forward to bringing you more of this type uh, in 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, uh, for the updates. Um, at the time, do we have any new business? Seeing none, um, I don't have any new business, but a follow-up. Um, back in 2023, um, we asked for staff to have, um, I guess, the city of Tampa to give an update on the Jackson House. Um, so um, we asked for staff to come in last year, but they were unable to come in. Is there something that can happen soon or uh, hopefully at the next meeting? Um, because again, it's been about a year and we've asked for an update and passing through. I'm not sure if <laughs> we have a storm coming up this weekend. I'm not sure if the building is still gonna be standing. So if possible, we can have an update from, um, I believe Mr. Elise was supposed right. to come in. Um, I did uh, speak with Mr. Drumgo. He, uh, he did indicate that he can come back at a future uh, hearing. We are still negotiating some of the details of the agreement with the adjacent property owners. He did let me know that uh, the uh, city is waiting on some information back from the Florida Department of Transportation on its willingness to vacate some right-of-ways that were part of that discussion. So we uh, it does obviously take some time to go through that process, but 
Uh, if it's the board's uh, desire, we can, I can request that he continue on March or that he appear on March 19th and provide a, uh, n another update for you. Yes, thank you. Um, in favor, well, I don't think that needs to be a motion, but right. Ed, uh, as the chair, I would love for a, a update. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll see if he is available and place on the agenda. All right, thank you for this your time. Thank you. Right now, the time is 9.55 a.m. and uh, would like to adjourn the Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you.